my job is to uh, is to uh, convey the knowledge of the saints in contemporary language and um, to give that ancient sacred perspective and then to uh, to look at, review, examine uh, current modern perspectives because most of you are saturated with modern perceptions. You know. So we have to see, we have to do a, an evaluation to find out accuracy. Let's see. Or at least to find a, a useful method of inquiry. That's actually the most important thing, to find a useful method of inquiry. See? Mm -hmm. So we all have a gazillion beliefs, a gazillion notions, uh, fables, ideas of the issue of death, the issue of dying. How many of them have been verified? You know, some of it is pretty powerfully emotionally uh, tied to. We have secondary knowledge, but do we have direct primary knowledge? See, that's where the yogis come in, <laughs> the saints come in, because they're, they're not keen on hearsay. A yogi is a soul one of the aspects or qualities of yogi is that that's a soul who wants to know directly for themselves. They don't want to, they'll entertain dialogue and hearsay and mythology. They'll listen, they'll pleasantly listen. But at the end of the day, they want to know for sure. <laughs> they want to know for sure. So, that's the uh, attitude that I encourage all of you. I'm not saying believe Hari. Not necessary. Not necessary. I say listen and then find a really good means of inqu inquiry. See? See? And then, if you're going to find a secondary source, search for those souls who have had the greatest and the most powerful and most positive effect on humanity. Why listen to the mother, brother, sister, son, which are pleasantly part of the chattering of humanity, but not truly informed? You know, good, honest, kind, decent, but not adequately informed. They're sort of sitting in the the same leaky boat that you're sitting in, mm -hmm. you know? So, it's like two landlocked people on a boat, and they're out to sea, and one looks and says, can you swim? And the other one says, looks and says, can you swim? <laughs> what are you asking this guy for, <laughs> you know? He's been landlocked like you, you're on your first voyage. So it's a dilemma. Now, if there was a sailor in the boat, there'd be far more comfort. Because if you figured, you ask him, can you swim, you got half a chance. <laughs> but uh, we're often informing ourselves by people who have not been informed. We've been informed by uh, fear and mythology. Fear and mythology. So, even when we started, we started off with a, uh, trying to sit and have some peace, try to enter a, a condition of meditation. You could actually say, I'll give you an unorthodox, unorthodox but actually correct definition, not heard very often. You can say that that meditation is the process of bringing death to death. Mm -hmm. See? The process of bringing death to death. It's unorthodox, but it's also correct. See? The re 
reason for that is that uh, in the process of meditation, you are going beyond your biological or your corporeal existence. Almost 100% of our life, we're doing everything in reference to our physical biology. You know, how do I feel today? We ask ourselves consciously or unconsciously that every day. How do I feel? You know, is my back aching, my head aching, do I have a toothache? You know, you know, you had some emotional issue, you had a physical response. So we're assumed in relating to ourselves primarily physically. And then within that physicality, there's emotional dynamics and there's intellectual dynamics. If you look at human physicality, human emotionality, a human uh, intellectual facility, what thought hasn't ended? What, what emotion hasn't come and gone? What physical experience hasn't arised and fallen? So they're all in flux. And every thought that you have and every emotion that you have affects your physicality, how, how you physically experience the world. See? So you, you, you have to sort of understand the situation that you're in. You're... Uh, sort of steeped in an ocean of physicality. You're completely underwater in that. And so is everybody else that you're talking to, that you're relating to, that you're spending time to. So you have to understand now that your lens of perception is primarily physical. Of course you have emotions, of course you have intellect. But at the, at the end of the day, when the bear is chasing you, what are you thinking about? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, you're trying to save your keister. <laughs> so, so that means when crisis comes, you know, you're not thinking about Einstein's philosophy. You know, you're, you're thinking on a biological level, you know, how, you know, trying to maintain the form. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to sort of do an analysis to, to say what the situation is, you know, that we are far more physically influenced than we imagine. Mm -hmm. you know, if that wasn't true, the beauty industry would collapse, <laughs> but it's a very robust industry. You know, the med medical industry would have a fit. You know, so we also have massive institutions that their whole deal is to focus your attention on form. Turn on the television. You know, how many doctor shows are there? You know. And then the police and firemen shows are about saving people, <laughs> saving their form. The cop doesn't run up and say, how do you feel today? <laughs> you know, he's, he's trying to save someone's form. So consciously or unconsciously, I'm not saying that emotionality is not profound and vital. It is. Mentality is not profound and vital. It is. But at the end of the day, <laughs> A lot of your consciousness is physical. A lot is physical. You know, what is she? How does she see me? You know, how does he see me? You know, you know, how do I look today? You know, how do I feel today? It's all body awareness. So we're like plunged into that into that sea. No problem. It's just an aspect of life, no problem. It's okay. But if you're going to uh, 
tackle a, a measure, a, a, a massive issue as is there a dying process? Is there a death? And you're s completely steeped in one perspective, looking at the issue through one lens. Do you think you're going to come to a very accurate analysis? Not likely. Not likely. It's like a fellow who has a one point of view, but he has to go through a multitude of experiences of life. Will that one point of view really be fit for all the multitude of experiences? Not likely. Not likely. Through the blessing of God, we, we have that angst where we realize that whatever our psychology, whatever our philosophy, doesn't always line up with the experiences that we're acquiring. You know, if one, you know, let's say a, a, a principle of science, we apply it to all things, it's not possible. It's not possible. It won't apply to every circumstance. It'll apply to certain circumstances. It'll apply to the circumstances that it's appropriate to, but it won't apply to a circumstance that's very variant to it. See? When looking at this process of uh, death and dying, we have to sort of think, okay, how do I do a 360 view of this? You know, how do I try to see it from all perspectives, or as many perspectives as I can ascertain, and then do an analysis of what are the more viable means of viewing this issue. You know, not just to take what my cousin Louise told me and say that's the, that's the truth. You know, that may be the truth for Louis, but that may not be your truth. You know, so God's grace gave us angst. You know, that, that angst is actually what makes civilization grow. It gives us an opportunity to see if there's anything else. Are there any more applicable views, applicable circumstances, applicable methodologies? See? Without that angst, you know, we'd be like a cardboard box that never changed. We'd just be sitting there on the shelf. You know, but the human experience is creative. It is creative by nature. The human experience. So we have to examine our our views. You know, is death as we conceptualize it? Is death so? My point is maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not so so. You know, maybe there's more to it. You know. So if we can uh, take an elementary analysis and say, okay, I was once a boy, then I was a young man, and then I'm a mature man, and then I'm an old man. Physicality changed to all those different points. Now the question is, what didn't change? What, what didn't change was that you were conscious. That's the thing that didn't change. The body of yesterday is not the body of today. What about the consciousness? Oh, we say, well, the consciousness was there, but I don't know a whole lot about it because I really wasn't paying attention, but I know it was there. I know for a fact it was there. I don't know if it changed or not, but I know it was present. I do know my physicality changed a lot. I do know that the emotions that I had as a child are not the emotions I have now. And I do know that the, the ideas and mentality I had as a child is not the ideas and mentality that I have today. So now we know for a fact the body changed. 
the emotions changed. Our mentality changed. We have consciousness, but we don't know if it changed or not. We don't know. We know it was present, but we can't say for a fact that it changed. Okay? So now it is a good, interesting question. You know, we know that it was present throughout. The other three were present throughout, but we can say for sure that the other three changed. But we don't know about consciousness. Okay. Now when we're talking about consciousness, we're not talking about your intellectual facility. Your intellectual facility is a method of perceiving the world. Your emotionality is another method of perceiving the world. Your physicality through the five senses is a method of perceiving the world. See? You don't know that about consciousness. You simply don't know. Now the saints and the sages of the, of the ages have said, if I don't know, I want to know. So they devised a, a methodologies where they could put the body into suspension. They could put the emotionality into suspension. They could put your mentality, your intellectual facility into suspension. And then simply to observe what's there. What's left? What's going on? <laughs> See? So this is a, a, a psychic laboratory that is constructed to be able to see what's going on. You shouldn't make any, say, oh, consciousness is this, consciousness is that. What's that based on? It's based on nothing. Based on your own personal myth. You know, that's nothing. Useless. It's best to say, I have no idea what consciousness is. Let me put everything into its suspension and take a look. Now we know that throughout our life, there's been consciousness. You can even say, well, was I conscious when I was sleeping? Well, who observed the dream? <laughs> who observed the dream? You had to be conscious. You had to be conscious. I remember my dream. I was floating, whatever. <laughs> so we know consciousness is present, whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. It's, it's present. Now in, when you sit for the process of meditation, all of these facilities are slowly trained to become peaceful. You don't discard uh, the physical senses, the emotional facility or intellectual facility. You don't discard them. You simply put them on the shelf. You, you put them into a, a temporary suspension, but always reachable. They're always accessible. But when you're not using the... Is there another pillow? There's a pillow there. What you're sitting in? Okay. Here, put this behind your back. So, you know that uh, consciousness is, has been present, and it's been present during the course of your life, but you never examined it. You know, mom and dad didn't say, hey, sit still. Well, they told you to sit still, but they didn't tell you to be aware. <laughs> See? Mm -hmm. So, in this whole process of meditation, There's a profound, deep, relentless activity of awareness. So we've all, we've all had some relationship to death. Well, we've all had a relationship to both death and immortality. We've, we've had a relationship with both. But we've put all of our attention on the death side. <laughs> See? And if you if you really want to look at this whole death issue, it's better to change the nomenclature around, the wording around, and get off the idea of death and the 
examine the concept of transition. Okay? Because death is a sentence with a period at it. And you really don't know if that's true. If, if, you're, if you're radically honest, you don't know if it's true. You got a lot of you know, ideas that say it's so. Mother, brother, sister, friend said it's so. But you don't know if it's really, 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 really so. You know that the whole physicality is going through a transition, mentality is going through a transition, emotionality is going through a transition. You don't know about consciousness. If you didn't have consciousness, what good would be all of your intellectual facility? What good would be your emotionality? Without consciousness, what good would be all of your wonderful physicality and all the wonderful and creative things you could do with it? What good would it be? Not a heck of a lot. See? So all of these wonderful facilities are really based on an unexamined element. <laughs> We've got tremendous facilities, but it's all based on an unexamined element <laughs> that you can't say for sure ever changed or not. You can say that for sure body changed, emotions changed, mentalities changed, but you can't say for sure consciousness has changed. You can't say for sure. You know, so it's just like a question mark. Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. So if your emotionality and physicality and mentality are all based on consciousness, is there immortality? It's a question. It's a question. Can't, you can't burn consciousness. The wind can't blow it down. Can it be consumed? Not likely. So we're saying that there are multiple dimensions. One dimension, this physical piece of clay exists in. Another dimension, all the nature of the heart resides in. Another dimension, the mentality, the ideas, the intellectual creativity. It's all another dimension. You can't poke or burn a thought. It's another dimension. What about consciousness? <laughs> it's another dimension. Another dimension. So all of our physical sciences, we've examined physical dimension. You know, through all the music and art and psychology, we've examined emotions, we've examined mentality. It's only the sacred sciences that examine the highest consciousnesses have, have actually built methodologies to examine consciousness itself. They were like the, the, the yogis, the saints and the masters, current and past, were souls that asked the most fundamental questions. And at the root, they said, I want to know what's real. I understand there's all this temporality going on around me, and I respect it, I honor it, I live with it, I work with it, I'm part of it. But is that all there is? And they found, no, it's not all there is. So their understanding of the whole death and dying issue is far more nuanced. From our common mortal perspective, we say either you're here or you're not. <laughs> because that's what's obvious, that's what's apparent. See, because something is apparent, does it really mean it's real? It means it's apparent. It doesn't mean it has absolute substance. It means it's apparent. You know, it's like a working assumption, but we don't know if it's a fact. See? So, so many of us have a, a deep and often hidden 
fear of mortality. The truth is what we really fear is pain. <laughs> That's really what it gets down to. Because we don't know the death experience itself because, quote, quote, we don't think we've experienced it. But what we do feel, fear, is the squeeze of the python or the bite of the bear. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's what, that's what we've acquainted death with. We've, we've acquainted death with pain. But maybe it's not. Maybe death is death and pain is pain. See? And then, because, quote, quote, death is like a massive unknown, we just sort of figure it's massively painful. <laughs> so, like, we go way, way out of our way to avoid it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want anything to deal with it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to be around it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to know it. Because, you know, that's like the anvil over your head. You know, it's like, I don't want to deal with it, you know. <laughs> you know, I'll let that tiger be. So, we live with a hidden angst a hidden fear that the bear is going to catch up to us. And we know it's going to catch up to us. We don't know when. So that fear is there, yes. What drives suicide? Oh, interesting. There's multiple answers to that. Um, Uh, the, the, I'll say two things. Uh, a profound lack of inquiry into life. And a profound lack of connection to life. See? You didn't inquire deep enough. And you were profoundly disconnected. See? So... In, in that disconnection, there's an isolation, mm -hmm. see? In that isolation, there is a profound depression. That pr depression is pain. We want to escape pain. So, mm -hmm. because of the lack of inquiry, we think we can escape pain through throwing off the mortal coil. Okay. Profound isolation, psychic isolation. So in a, in a cycle of negativity. Well, that's part of it. That's part of the lack of inquiry. Uh -huh. Without without deep, profound inquiry, every manner of er error of perception occurs. Uh -huh. See? And every answer we give will be the wrong answer. I don't know if every answer will, mm. but without appropriate inquiry into the life itself, um, there is a visual jaundice. Mm -hmm. See? The, the, the ability for greater and greater error in perception can occur. Mm -hmm. See? And that error in perception amplifies. Yes, yeah. Amplifies. Mm -hmm. so, uh, other questions? Well, well, no, yeah, yes, okay. Um, if consciousness is like, um, I guess if it does exist, mm. and I wonder why is it that I can't remember anything beyond a certain point? In other words, I can't remember my birth. Mm. I can't remember when I was in my mother's womb. <laughs> it's only after a certain amount of years after interacting with the physical world that you develop any sort of memories. Like, for example, I can remember things like when I was three someone stole something from me. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Mm -hmm. But I can't exactly remember anything beyond that yes. or before that. Yeah. Good question. In these analyses, you have to use your intellectual facility as skillfully as a surgeon uses a knife. And what you're doing in saying, I can't remember being in my mother's womb, such, such ideas like that, is you're confusing 
intellectual facility of which memory is part of it and also has some biological base through the brain. If both brain and intellectual facility are both involved, though not necessarily consciousness, those are facilities that have manifest out of consciousness, but they are not consciousness itself. Right now, you have to have a working assumption or a theorem that consciousness is a functional unknown. That we have a word, consciousness, but we really haven't flushed out what it is. See? So right now, we'll, we'll slop over the idea of mentality and memory and assume that that's consciousness. From the yogic perspective, it's not consciousness. From the yogic perspective, those are just facilities of which consciousness is something else. Just like physicality is one thing, emotionality is one thing, mentality is another thing, consciousness is another thing. See? So, you're not right, you're not wrong. All I'm saying is accept some uh, working assumptions. And then, bit by bit, over time and process, we try to flush it out. What is mentality? And what is consciousness? Because right now, we bind them together. And from the yogic perspective, not so. These are different facilities. There's a limitation to mentality. To mentality. It, it has its realm. There's a limitation to emotionality. It has its realm. There's a limitation to physicality. It has its realm. By yogic perspective, perspective, there is no limitation on consciousness. There's no limitation on consciousness. And, and that sort of begs the issue, is if there's no limitation to consciousness, and if there's no beginning and no end, which is the statement declared by the saints, the question is, or the positive is, is there death? And if we are steeped in our physicality, steeped in our emotionality, steeped in our mentality, but not knowing of our, our consciousness, but we're steeped in these other three facilities, of course, those three facilities are going to be our, our primary reference point. Consciousness will not be our primary reference point. Pr consciousness will be uh, an intellectually posed uh, idea, notion. It'll be a... a, a like a theorem, like maybe it's here, let's see if we find a way to flush it out and see if it's really real. See? But I'm saying that that's the one thing that didn't change through the course of all the other changes. Even in your dream state, who was watching the dream? See? So, you can say, okay, maybe there's conscious, maybe there's not. No problem. Per perfectly reasonable perspective. But you can say, that the great yogis, who were the masters of, of experimentation with the, with the human condition, of which the psyche is part of that, they say consciousness is so, and there's a way to experience it. Or there's multiple, multiple, experience, multiple methodology of experimentation with consciousness itself. See? So, us as regular human beings, we haven't done the experiments. You know, we've had all kinds of physical, emotional, and intellectual experiences, but we haven't done the experiments with consciousness itself. And this is where the yogis are important. This is where the yogis, the saints and the masters, are on, on part of an elite spectrum of humanity. They're, they're the part of humanity who has done those experiments. See? We as good, common people have not yet done those experiments. So it, it, consciousness itself is an abstraction that we haven't flushed out, that we, that we can't really talk about deeply until we've done some profound, fundamental experimentation. See?
So the idea of consciousness, just put a big question mark by it, because we haven't even flushed out the definition. <coughs> Maybe the definition doesn't even exist in this dimension. Yes? Richard, do we have the same uh, level of consciousness, say, as an embryo versus you know, a full-grown adult? Interesting. Or as a, an aging person? I mean. <coughs> consciousness itself is, is universal and full, always. The question comes with uh, physical, emotional, and intellectual awareness. Okay. See? That's different. That's different. How much awareness of consciousness do we have? See? You know, like, I have poor awareness of uh, mathematics. Half the time I don't know the day or the month. Actually, most of the time I don't know. I have to ask my wife. You know? Some people, like my grandmother, she can say, in 1936, July 6th, it was a Tuesday. <laughs> you know? And she could tell me everything that happened that day. You know? Seven people came home. We had a big mm -hmm. dinner. You know, that's where me, I have no idea. I don't know the date of yesterday or today. So my awareness, which is an intellectual facility, is limited. So we all have different awarenesses. Some people are very emotionally aware. Some people are very musically aware. Some people are very scientifically aware. Okay. We're going to let people shift. Sorry, I'm just going to Oh, okay. his hand moved over there. Do you want to sit on a chair? Here, go ahead. If someone wants to sit here, they can. All these creaky young people, what is going on? <laughs> I have to teach some health sciences. <laughs> yes, Susan. Does, that, does, does that mean a dog has the same consciousness as a human, but his awareness is different? You can, you can say that, because uh, consciousness is uh, universal, infinite, pervasive. But access to consciousness, or awareness of consciousness, is another issue. You know? Does a fish or a mouse or a dog or a horse or a human have the same level of awareness? They all experience the world. They all have some kind of emotion. They all have some kind of mentality. But access to awareness of consciousness is another issue. Even the humans themselves don't have much access. Not because they don't have the potential, but because they haven't done the experiments. See? They haven't. They haven't worked out the process. In, I'm talking about human, humanity in mass, not humanity in, in isolation with, with the saints and such. Yes, Ami. So when you were talking earlier, you were talking about all the things you notice that have changed, like mentality, physicality, emotionality. Mm. But there's something that, not, that doesn't change. Right. And so that's what I label consciousness Correct. without knowing Correct. what it really is. Correct. But then, does consciousness have a goal? Oh, that's a very human perspective. And I, know, I knew it was when I said the word goal, but what's its purpose? Well, there is no way we can... It's like saying, the, the analysis, an analogy is to say, Let's, and we're going to make a big assumption. God exists. Now, we can't access what God is. And then we can say, then we ask the, the very human question, what's its purpose? Is that knowable in this realm? No, not knowable in this realm. Not, not knowable. You know, it's like saying to a mouse, please speak French. <laughs> <laughs> the mouse has mouse facility. Common human mentality has common mentality. You can't make the dimensional leap. See? So, to pose the question is good, but to also have the understanding that using current facilities, not possible. Not possible. And we even make the assumption that the answer lies within thought. Mm -hmm. 
because we're a thought, emotionally, physically based. What if there's a dimension beyond that thought, of which every great master says there is? Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Nice yeah. Yes, James. So you said that um, the saints have done the experience and have gained insight into consciousness. Direct knowledge. So is that cons is it too abstract to transfer and codify and educate? Or is it, is it something that All we just have to experience for ourselves to understand? No, you have many great texts. Patanjali Sutras was a, a great saint that codified it codified the methodology, the yogic methodology of meditation and the nature of mind and the nature of phenomena and laid out a very direct methodology to, to do that inquiry and to do those experiments. See? The ultimate result of those experiments can't be spoken. But the road to that, that reality has been laid out. And really, in all the great mystic traditions, there are, there are <coughs> maps of, of process. In all of the traditions, it's there. But it's very clearly laid out in potentially sutras. Yeah, and many others, but there's many schools that have codified methods of, of approaching reality. Yes, ma'am. So was I hearing you correctly when, uh, when you said in a meditative state, when you meditate, um, the idea is to put aside the physicality, mentality, mm -hmm. emotionality, mm -hmm. so that you can get closer to this idea of consciousness? Or Not, um, you can come into a, a, a perception of it. Because all of your senses are lenses of perception. All of your emotions and heart, it's a lens of perception. You know, you know, how I think about you is one perception. How I feel about you is another perception. You know, you and I jogging together is another perception. See? A physical perception of how we work well together or not so well together. See? So, these are functional lenses of perception. But they're not the only experience. They're very vital. They're very dynamic. But they're not the only experience. The yogi wants you to have full knowledge of existence. So right now we're saying we have examined three parts, but not the fourth part. And even of the three parts, have we had full experience of physicality? Have we had full experience of emotionality? Have we had full experience of mentality? No. We have partial experiences of all of it. See? So that's not, none of those three baskets are full. And the other fourth basket is just a silent unknown. It's present. It's present through all of them. But it's unexamined. See? By, by in large part, by humanity in mass unexamined. It's like, it's like air. It's necessary to the, to the physical existence, but not really by, by mass commonly observed. A scientist in his laboratory will observe the nature of air. He will break it down into its components. But in mass, we don't, we don't, we don't examine it, we don't observe it, but it's necessary to our to our existence. Consciousness is like air. It's necessary to your mentality, necessary to your emotionality, necessary to your physicality. But in mass, unexamined. Unexamined. Wouldn't you say it's more than necessary? Wouldn't you say it's the instigator? Isn't it the driver of all those other things? Yeah, without it, the others are not possible. It's not possible. The others are not possible without, without it. It is the one micro way of saying it, it's the seed, it, it's, it's the hidden vital factor.
that allows all the others. It's the verb to be nouns. <laughs> it allows all those other things to be active. See? As opposed to inert. Using the word inert brings another thought to mind. So we think, oh, this element is animate. This element is inanimate. Is that really true? <laughs> or is that an assumption? We, we, we absolutely say that's inanimate. It's dead. Just because everybody agrees on that, is it really true? <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it's not. The yogis say it's not. The yogi says consciousness itself is infinite, you know, indestructible, absolutely pervasive. So, is that what we consider inert? Really, really, really inert? It may be functioning at a level of activity lower than our perception. You know, it, its consciousness can be moving so slow that we think it's dead, you know. But is that so different than a person in a coma that's not out jogging? Mm -hmm. You know, there's still life, but the vitality is greatly minimized. So why not isn't there life in that stone, but greatly minimized? It's still at a very primordial level of its, its evolution. So the yogis make uh, grand and deep statements about loving all things, honoring all things, respecting all things. You ever ask yourself why? Why respect that rock? Why love that tree? You know, it's maybe because they're not so disconnected. We pass the rocks and the trees because we're in our own limited psychic bubble. Whatever is going on with me and mine, you know, that's my business. And we're disconnected. But if, if the great master's primary dwelling place is in consciousness, can you see why they would not have a separation from the tree, from the river, from the stone, from the air? See? Why did Brother Francis say, you know, mother, son, sister, moon? See? Why did Francis say that? Was it just a, a poetic statement? Or was, or was he testifying to the, to the unity, the conscious unity of existence? And in, in inherent in the, cons, uh, the conscious unity of existence, an inherent intractable love, an inherent intractable respect, an inherent intractable uh, reverence for the air, for the sky, for the tree, for the stone. See? Why couldn't he remove anyone from his heart? And if you looked at Francis's life, one of the great leaps, because a saint is a master in the making, just like a disciple is a saint in the making, see? And an aspirant is a disciple in the making. And a, and a common human being, good but common, is an aspirant in the making. One of Francis's greatest hurdles was to overcome his fear and his repulsion of the leper. So when he finally was able to embrace, kiss, and hug a leper, that was, that was a watershed moment in his spiritual existence, where the, the leper, in his mind, was the, the epitome of repulsion. And it was, it was the embodiment of death in his heart and mind. But when he was able to embrace the leper fully, completely, then that level of consciousness he had more greater access to with this was no more division see because at that point 
and from his perspective, death itself was embraced. See? It was embraced with love. Complete acceptance. See? So, Francis went from a saint to a master because he fully embraced all of consciousness. All the manifestations that came from consciousness. See? All of the infinite expression he was able to embrace. That was the crucible that he crossed, and that brought him to, to mastery, which allowed him easily to look at all, all of nature as part of his own embodiment, part of his own divine expression, you know, as the nearest and dearest of kin. And he only used that for our benefit. For him, it was all part of his greater self. So that's consciousness. You know? But can you see how consciousness can be limited to this little um, nutshell of personality? <laughs> personality is a mixture of your of the th other three facilities. You know, your physical nature, your emotional nature, your, your mental nature. All that is in composite is your personality. You know, your history, your dreams. But the master learns to smash that and to say, I know what's temporal in me. What's immortal? Is there something immortal? And then to do the experiments. Yes, Christopher. Is, in life, is consciousness individualized, sort of the way that we describe souls? And then if it is, uh, after death, does it remain individualized? In other words, like, is my great-grandmother's consciousness still discreetly hers now that she's dead? That's a very sophisticated question. And, uh... Let's put it this way. Consciousness is immortal. It's universal, and it has no one point. You and I, as mortal beings, quote, quote, mortal beings, have a point. We're here, I'm here, then we're there, and then we're somewhere else. We're always in some point. Consciousness has no point. See? So, while we're still vested, and concentrated primarily on human facilities, we always have a point, which means we always exist within a, a type of basket, see? So until grandmother fully embraces consciousness itself, she'll be in a basket, maybe a subtle basket, but Nanda, yes, a basket. She'll be maintained in a point. So if you look at the, uh, the concept of reincarnation, we lose this mortal coil. The root is consciousness, but also the nature of mind is still present. You know, who says the mind just has to be localized to this point? Who says that? Doesn't, why? Why? This magnificent idea of, 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 of mentality why do we make the assumption it has to be localized to just one point? You know? It's, it's just an assumption. But until the full embrace is made, as says the saints, we exist in a subtle basket. First we have this big fat clay basket, but then we have these other more subtle forms of perception. And this subtle basket moves from incarnation to incarnation, seeking its own root experience. See? So, is she present? Yes. Will she be pre Has she ever lost existence? No. Will she ever lose existence? No. She actually won't. 
Will the nature of perception change? Absolutely. See? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Susan, you had a question? Did you answered it. It was about the animals and whether they had the same consequences. Like Not the same, but the same potential. Different. Different levels of access hope. Access and different awareness, yeah. but, but the same potential. is the same. Yeah. What they access is the same. Yeah, the potential oh, of the no, stone, yeah. the animal, the human are all the same. The potential is the same. The experience is different. Right. See? The experience is different. But the potential is the same. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we had said in the past that uh, acquiring the human for being born as a human is a privilege, in a sense, because mm -hmm. you have the ability to perceive. and um, It's the greatest opportunity. What causes, I mean, how does it... How does one get to acquire that form? I mean, is it do you do you evolve into a human being, or have you taken other forms b before, or how is that approached? Oh. Yeah, the, the, the theory, the idea of evolution is correct. It's but it's not the whole answer. It's part of the answer. Existence moves from form to form, gathering infinite experience. It's like the infinite self saying, I want to know every aspect mm -hmm. of infinity. So we'll move from form to form, seeking that experience. And with, with as we have, uh, as we are informed, deeper and deeper, it's another revolution, another turn on the coil mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of, ex of experience. Why? The answer is unknowable. Mm -hmm. Is this phenomenon occurring? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're gathering experience. Like, can we say that we have all the awareness of the, of the phenomena that's in our subconscious? That infinite basket of experience? Is it there? Well, it absolutely is there. Are we aware of its content? Not yet. See? Not yet. Will we be? Yes. Are we? No. See? Is it there? Definitely. Definitely. They say the mind records every phenomenon that you experience. Do you have recall of it? No. Is it recorded? Yes. Yes, Susan. Uh, the, the saints who, hmm? the saints whose consciousness expands to more universal, yeah, are they, they not reincarnate? Oh, us, okay, we have to be a little bit, saint is still unfinished. They're definitely going to be coming We're back. Okay, okay, I'll give two points. The saint will come back because they're still, though deeply aware, and sanctified, unfinished. They'll be compelled back. Master is beyond nature. There's no compulsion to come back. There's no, there's no evolutionary uh, mandate. But they do come back. Teach. Yeah. Teach. I, I once asked my master. My master is Sadhguru Sant Keshavadas. And one day I, I walked up to his room on the second floor, tapped on his door, and nobody was around. So I'm thinking, yes, I'm going to ask some questions. You know, <laughs> quiet, nobody's there, just he and myself. Great. You know, you know, always take the shot. You know, always take the shot, ask the questions. So I, and I had, there was nothing to do. So I'm, I'm, I go in there, I'll rearrange the pencil, sweep the floor, I don't care. Because it's just an opportunity to be with him and, uh, you know, ask some questions. And uh, he happened to be, when I tapped and went in, um, he was standing at the window, uh, just gazing out. So I'm thinking, okay, what to ask, what to ask, what to ask. You know, like, it's like, great, great opportunity. Take the shot. So I say, uh, uh, Guruji. And I'm going to try to ask some big question, you know. 
Don't ask little questions. Ask really big questions. Uh, Guruji, uh, where will you die? You know, I don't know why I asked that question, but that's the question I had. And he, and he turned his head and said, Hari, I'll die in India, of course. Said, oh, oh, okay. Oh, Guruji, will I be there? No, Hari, you're not going to be there. And I go, oh, damn, I really, you know, to be with your master when he transits is a really great thing. So I was like, oh, gee, that's too bad. Then the next question came up. Guruji, will you come back? And at that point, the whole environment changed in the room. At that point, he's still standing at the window, and he turned slowly, and he looked deeply at me. And there's like this massive silence in the room, like, whoa. And with great, you know, gravitas, he said, Hari Charan, as long as there is suffering in the world, I will return. He said it with such power, it went right to my bones, you know. I mean, every, it was like honey or syrup, it's dripping with pregnant, you know, thought, feeling, conviction. As long as there is suffering, I will return. Like, I mean, it just suffused your being. He, he said it with that kind of deep, reverent commitment. So I was like, I almost got dizzy for a moment because the way he had said it. And, and then I had a amusing but slightly selfish thought. I said, Jesus, damn, my master is coming back. And I am his man, his his chala, his disciple. That means I have to come back because we're like the shadow. You know, we're like the fingers on the hand. You know, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this place is tough, and he's coming to come back until the last human being. You know, is, is taken out of suffering. You know, I'm thinking, oh my God. You know, and I signed up for this. You know. So, I mean, I'm just telling you a short but true story. <laughs> I got over that, you know, because I figured, hey, you know, whether you go to heaven or you go to hell, if you go with your master, you're going good. <laughs> it, it's a good deal. It's the best deal you're going to get. So, you know, but get you get close and hold on. Is doesn't my... that statement imply that he believed that there would be a day there would be no suffering? No, you're making a massive uh, assumption. Mm. And... Uh, you, this is huge um, ex, 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 uh, esoteric uh, subject mm. where there's massive cycles of, of evolution. See? Massive cycles of evolution mm, where you can say the, the birth of adamant creation and it runs through a, a, a massive cycle of a kuyuga, a, a great age where a, a body of, of, of beings runs through the course of their own self-revelation, mm -hmm. self-illumination. Uh, it's, a, it's a cycle. Mm. But it's not the only cycle, mm -hmm. see. So this great body of experience occurs, and then the cycle ends. So during this you, yeah. that suffering will be there, and he'll keep coming back. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There is no knowledge of why these things are so. They are so. The answers to why don't exist in this realm, but it is so. Why is there gravity? I don't know. Is it so? Yes. Why? I don't know. Is there an answer to it? Yes. Does the answer necessarily exist in this realm? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe part of the answer exists here, maybe part of the answer is beyond this realm. See? But it's so. Other ideas, other thoughts, questions? Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to um, 
Could you could talk, talk a little bit about attachments and um, projects? Because you had talked earlier about, um, you know, our, our fear of death is really the fear of Okay, you can, you can use the word, you can take that word attachment and tie the word limitation to it. Mm. See, it's, this is looking at it in a context. With every attachment, there's a limitation. See, does that make sense? Does that make sense? With every attachment, there's a limitation. Yeah. Now, if I'm to say that you're supposed to be unlimited, immortal, eternal, mm -hmm. not a point. See, the moment you have an attachment, you have a limitation, and you're stressing a point. You're not stressing your greater nature. See? You're stressing a phenomena within your mortal realm of perception. See? Okay. I don't know if I've, I've answered your question in a big way. I don't know if you want a deep, a, small, a smaller answer. Mm. I was just thinking about it as it relates to death. I think often the, you had said uh, you talked about the, the fear of pain of death and I think that yeah, death also we equate death with pain and I'm saying maybe yes maybe no maybe not so See? so it, it's only through uh, the appropriate examination can we say what's so what's not so but what I'm saying is that we we make massive assumptions and massive associations that or maybe not so accurate, you know. Maybe pain is pain and death is death. Mm -hmm. See, and I'm saying maybe there's not really death. Maybe death is a misperception based on an unfully analyzed condition. Mm -hmm. See. Anyway, there's a there's a there's some yoga, very simple but very effective. Um, experiments that we can do. Um, I got this. Actually, I got it for your wife to show you. But seeing that everybody's here, I'm going to grab this and uh, show you something interesting. I hope you think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is a, uh, this is a, a visual a method of mind training. So we have a bowl here, and within this bowl, if I can, there is ash. See this ash? This ash has come from the various incense that we burn all the time. And that ash is placed within the bowl. This is a, a micro sadhana and a, a, a way of visualizing a vast concept. So the bowl is like this clay pot that we're all living in. See? This clay pot is eventually become ash. There's no clay pot that's not going to become ash. It, it's, it's a fact. One way or the other, sometime or another, it's ash. So, and the ash has no more, it has limited form. You put it in a box, it becomes a box. Put it in a circle, it becomes a circle. See? It takes the form of whatever. So right now, it's in the clay pot. This pot, and it, its future, which is that ash, has a time. There was a beginning and there was an end. A start and a finish. Now, within that mortal coil, which inherent nature is the ash, 
we have these um, pearls. This is what you put on your shrine, these things, these pearls. The pearl dropped into the ash represents our consciousness. Something of beauty. Something precious. So, we can say, during the course of time, that we're coming and going. And this mortal coil resolves into ash. But though it resolves into ash, consciousness is persistent. Consciousness is persistent. So this is a visual way of reminding us of part of the course of our existence, of the reality. We have a clay pot. This clay pot will resolve to ash. But there's a persistent element of eternal beauty. See? Those uh, pearls. And it's a reminder so we're thinking, this, this is the deal. Get over this idea and notion of, uh, of death. The same energy that you, you put into fearing and uh, negating death, put it on to the pearl of consciousness. So when you look at this, you can say, yeah, life is all about change. And even this mortal coil is going to change and eventually become some dust. But that which is fundamental to the emotions, to the mind, to the form, will persist. And that is that pearl of consciousness. And now, in, in, in aiding yourself to heal yourself from that fear, and to heal yourself from the sorrow of those who have left, your mother, your brother, your friend, your child, your lover, your wife, your king, your you know, whomever. Drop a drop one of these pearls into this to remind yourself because the world is saying they're gone, they're dead, blah blah blah. blah. The the world myth, the world hypnosis is say death is death. The yogi says no. Any great sense saint says no. It's not so, that there's a, a persistent pearl of consciousness that persists. So your mother, your brother, your sister, your friend, your lover, did they die? The pearl says no. No. Did they change forms? Yes. Is there a persistence of consciousness? Yes. So let's say, like my grandmother, I, 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 many, many people in my life have passed. But I, I really loved my grandma. She was really wonderful. And she was also a great cook. I could come in the house at 2 o'clock in the morning. She'd jump up and make meal. It was, it was really wonderful. It was really wonderful. You know, you know, so do I have cause to, to, to miss this loving woman? Yeah, I have cause to miss this loving woman. But do I have the sense that this loving being is eternally persistent? Yes. Is that healing for the emotions? Yes. If I thought, oh, they dropped off a, 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 a dark cliff into the unknown abyss, would there be more sorrow? Yes. But would I say, ah, this pearl of existence is there. With good fortune, our love will bring us together again. Much more healing. you know. So when I look into this, into this ash, I say, yeah. Has the location changed? Yeah. But is there a persistent pearl of existence? Yes. Is that much more balanced perception? Perception. So let's say my good friend uh, Sylvia, she's here right now, and says, then a month from now she says, I'm going to live in France for the rest of my life. Will I see her again? No. Is she persistent? Yes. 
So with grandmother, mother, friend, lover, will I always be present with them? No. But do I have the love in my heart knowing that they persist? Yes. Okay. Much more healing perspective. Much more healing perspective. So these are our tools. So my time with my grandmother or my time with my, my mother. My time was this. That was my time with them. But do they persist? Yes. Yes. But I had a time with them, a period with them. But do they persist? Are they gone? No. They persist? Yes. See? Much more healing perspective, Ron. Yes. Do they still interact with your life? Oh, absolutely. And they, act, they, they interact with everyone's life. Um, that's another esoteric subject. Um, wow, th that, that's a very deep subject. Um, many ways to say that. In the, um, in the immediate, let's say, uh, within years, person's moving from one form to another form. They uh, interact with you primarily subconsciously, not always, but primarily subconsciously, due, due to whatever the strongest uh, emotions and the strongest thoughts that, are, that you two engaged with, whether it's even love or hate or whatever in between. The strongest elements will, uh, will, you're bound by those things. Those elements are actions, and those actions form karmas, because for every action there's a result. Okay, there's some kind of response. Okay. So, praying for those souls it's from our side, and they've simply moved to another dimension, like Sylvia going to France. It's just another region that they're that they're presently in. By the by, the uh, power of prayer, unconsciously, by the power of prayer, you're tapping into the consciousness. Not just your mentality, not just your heart, not just your physicality, but you're, con you're tapping into your more root condition, or your root condition, consciousness. You're making a micro-access, a thread to consciousness. And through that, that universal loving light existence, you can touch them. And you can also assist them, and vice versa. It works both ways. Okay. You know... Now, as you become deeper endowed in yogic sciences and yogic methodology and yogic proficiency, can it move from an unconscious to a conscious level? Absolutely. 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 No doubt. No doubt at all. You simply must acquire the facility. See? Train, in, train in the skill, the facility comes. Don't train in the skill, it'll maintain, on, it'll, it'll function on an unconscious level. We're not the only species of existence. You know, we're like the early people in Gal Galileo's time saying the sun revolves around the earth. So the, human, the humans at this time think we're the only higher species, that we're the top of the, the food chain. Just like in G Galileo's time, it was an assumption. In our time, that we're the only conscious, intelligent, viable species. Pure speculation. Pure speculation. Yeah. All the saints of the Old Testament were talking about great angels. Were they delusional? Was it mythological? Or they, were they talking about a higher reality that they had perceived? That had become living visceral reality? Yeah. 
Just because the masses haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not so. You know? okay. So we always have to look at life with a great question mark. You know? And it's best to inform yourself by those souls who have gone the furthest in their evolution. Okay. So, oh, there's another aspect to this uh, exercise. I, I told you the, the early visual part. The, the sadhana to this, so we have this element here sitting to, to inform us, a visual way of informing, a visual and oral way of informing us as to part of, this, part of the reality of life. Not the assumption of life, but part of the reality of life. The other part of the, uh, of the practice, because this whole getting over the idea and getting over the fear of death, this is a big emotional issue. It's more emotional than intellectual. And it's more emotional than physical. Is to learn to quietly saturate ourselves. So in that sadhana, it's, it's often best, it can be done anywhere, but it's often best to be sitting in a place of nature, by the seashore, by the river, on a mountainside. And the, the sadhana says, don't look to the left, don't look to the right, don't look up, don't look down. Gaze forward. So we sit and we acquire a position of poise, and then our eyes are open, and then with our breath, As the breath goes out, the word going. As the breath comes in, coming. And then as we gaze, just simply gazing forward, and with the breath, we're to constantly say coming and going. Coming and going. So the whole facility of mind and heart are on the concept of things coming and things going. And over time, you, you're, it, because it's more than conscious, you have to saturate your unconscious with the nature of, of acknowledging the fact that everything arises and everything falls. Everything comes and everything goes. But we've never taken the time to really absorb that message. So you set your timer, whether it's a half hour, 20 minutes, an hour, and you do this gaze. And you allow yourself to become saturated with the idea that everything you perceive arises and falls. Everything that you see is going to come and is going to go. And it has to happen not only on an intellectual level, but on an emotional level. We have to come to a point of complete acceptance, a complete absorption in the fact that whatever we gaze at, no matter what infinite a variety of manifestation comes across our gaze, it will come and will go. And it, it, we have to do this practice until we become emotionally at peace. Because before we've just been ignoring the issue. We haven't thought about it. We just haven't thought about it. We just haven't dealt with it. But when we can completely emotionally acknowledge and accept that whatever we perceive is going to come and go, then we come to a point where we're all right with it. We say, we accept that this is the nature of life. This, this, this is it. And just as we accept our breath coming and going, we don't fight with that, but we do fight with the coming and going of life. This has changed. You wanted to hold on to that change, or you wanted to repulse another change. See? As opposed to simply accepting it, that coming, it was okay. Going, it was okay. I'm good with it. I'm good with it. You know, I accept it's time. So whether it's my mother, my brother, my friend, my favorite dog, whatever, I'm good with it. I accept it. I simply accept it. I don't think about this. I don't dream about that. I simply emotionally accept it. See? Would this not release a tremendous emotional burden? Tremendous emotional burden. 
to come to a point of acceptance. The sorrow came from holding on. I want more, I want more. As it's just emotionally accepting, I'm good with it. Accepting your place in nature and just being good with it. When a leaf falls from the tree, did the tree experience sorrow? Or did it simply accept it as part of the process, part of nature? It, it's completely bound with the manifestation of the leaf, with the preservation of the leaf, and the loss of the leaf. It's, it's completely harmonious with the process. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't fight with it. We, because of our attachment, fight. Hmm? Yeah, I'm just thinking of the Bhagavad Gita, hmm? where Krishna is telling Arjuna about how he has uh, a duty Mm. And something we, we mostly think of as pretty terrible mm. uh, to be a warrior mm. um, and he says that we're impelled to do these things um, I guess because of our attachments or because of our karma but I'm trying to fit that with what you've just explained about this wonderful acceptance mm. um, and trying to fit that together can you help me a little there? yeah 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 Th this, is a, this is one of God's greatest texts it, it is part of the heartbeat of the yogi, is the Bhagavad Gita. Everyone must study it. Arjuna is compelled, due to his karma and his prayers, to protect the righteous, to protect the nation to repulse the darkness that would consume the kingdom. The Lord has compelled him to do that. Stand and fight. But in another place in the Gita, it is clearly stated, those who perceive or presume anyone has died or been born has not perceived correctly. So there's the temporal theater and the eternal reality that's going on. The eternal reality was all of this is me. God saying all of this is me. But the dream experience was that all of life must come to a crucible where they choose the path of light or they have to choose the path of darkness. And the light must consume the darkness. See? Not necessarily destroy, but make it part of itself. See? So there was no, in that war, there was no anger, there was no bitterness against the opposing forces. And there was every, every effort to appease uh, the forces, the Yodinus forces. <coughs> Once the appeasement couldn't be made, then the battle had to begin. And in the battle, the light pervaded over the darkness. But again, no anger, no recrimination. It was just a yagna, a sacred fire, a sacrifice that had been made to establish the light pervasively. So it was a, a great sacred sacrifice The imprint, the psychic imprint of that will flow through humanity where you have variant impulses, some negative, some positive. But at the end of the day, Krishna stood, means the light stood, the reality stood, and consumed all things as part of itself. There was no death. There was a, a dream. And in that dream, 
infinite impulses. Each, each character represents an impulse or a quality. And all of those impulses and all of those qualities were consumed in this great fire, this great yagna. So yagna means sacrifice. And the psychic impulse of that is all things just like this will come to dust, but the pearl of perfection is always present. See? So that great fire <coughs> occurred, but it was a teaching for humanity that at the end of the day, the light or the pearl of infinite consciousness was the only reality, was the, was the last statement, was the, only, was, was the only reality in this transient dream. But everything was infinitely possible. You know, all, all possibility was present on the field, but there was only one fact on the field, and that was the light. See, Krishna, Sri Krishna used his agent, Arjuna, so, but he was present, but not active. He was the consciousness behind all the, all the phenomena. He was the, the stable amongst the unstable. See? He was the infinite amongst the temporal. See? So he showed us there's a grand dream with all potentiality. But at the end of the dream, consciousness alone resides. The light alone resides. Everything else, even the dharmic ones, were still shadows of the light, not, not fully part. But they will be brought into that fire and become the light. And part of that fire was the fire of purification. Part of that fire was the fire of becoming part of the light, becoming the infinite body of, of Sri Krishna. Everybody must study the Gita. Gita is a spiritual genius, un unimaginable, unimaginable what you'll learn from it. You know? and, and those that study with me, mandatory you must study, minimum, minimum five. And in this house, there's well 30, 40 different commentaries. Um, but uh, you, you'll never stop studying that text. Never stop studying it. Every time you study, you say, why, why did I miss that? How come I didn't see this? Oh, I, there's, there's, no, there's no end to it. You know, there's no end to it. So it's a, it's, it's a must, must study. <coughs> and as you, as you refine your own spiritual practices, prayer, mantra, meditation, your insight into, into the drama of the Gita will increase. You'll, you'll never, ever read the same book twice. You'll always get more from it. It's one of those texts. Any other thoughts, ideas? I have one final thought. On yes, my dear. So, Ami. So, um, so it seems like it's consciousness that observes mm. the coming and the going. Mm. Because it's the only thing that's not coming and going. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm. That You're absolutely correct. The problem is we're only partially aware of our consciousness because we're viewing it through the, the lower facilities. Mm -hmm. See, we've, we, we've fully embraced the lower facilities. We haven't fully embraced the higher facility. And until we fulfill that journey, we'll only have partial perspective. See? We'll only have partial realization. Mm -hmm. See? But, you know, prayer, mantra, meditation, those are the, the, the classic methods of, of acquiring a, a full, full realization. You know, prayer is a divine dialogue. Mantra is a divine purification. Mm -hmm. Meditation is an absolute realization. See? See? Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we close? I'm happy everyone has come. You know, and if you have questions, always take the shot. You need, don't don't think, oh, that's a silly question. Or, oh, no, I'm, I'm the only one thinking. Forget about it. You know, the deal is to put it out there. Take the, always take the shot. You know, whatever your question is, it, it, it gives it's it's fun for me, and it gives me the opportunity. You know, to quietly ask the question inside, and then listen to be informed, and then you know put it out there. 
Because I have no idea. I actually have no idea. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's no notes here, you know. My preparation is saying prayers to my master. I say, God, Luigi, I'm here. I'm your instrument. And I come out here. That's my preparation. You know, I don't want to preconceive, oh, I'll give this and this. No. My, my job is to be receptive to my, my master and responsive to you. See? Receptive to my master and responsive to you. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring our, our spines erect. We'll just sit for a, just five minutes. <laughs> you poor fellow, your knees. <laughs> It'll get better. Take a deep breath in. Let it enter, enter into the silence. And learn to psychically, emotionally, physically relax in the silence.
three times. and all. 